In today's episode of Dracula A Reader's Guide, we're going to be looking at two characters, Mina Harker and Lucy Westenra. The development of these two characters often sparks lots of debates about feminism, and in particular what Stoker intends his audience to understand about women from the book. On one interpretation, Lucy Westenra is the epitome of a modern, sexually liberated woman, and Mina Harker is a obedient little wife, and the story is very much in favour of the little wife, and not so much in favour of the liberated woman. On the other hand, for some people, Mina Harker represents an ambitious, strong-willed, intelligent woman, while Lucy Westenra is more of a ditzy fool. I think in order to answer this question, we can't just look at Lucy and Mina, we have to also look at how these two characters play out in the story, and in particular how they relate to the male characters in the story. There'll be three parts to this video. First we'll examine Lucy's character. I'll show that ultimately she fits the role of a more traditional gothic heroine, passive, weak and incapable of helping herself. In part because of the men and the way that they treat her, but also to do with her characteristics as well. I'll argue that Mina fits the mould of a more forward-thinking and progressive style of woman, even if her standards don't live up to the ideals that would please feminists living today. I'll also argue that there seems to me to be a very important message about the way that men and women engage with each other. I'll point out that one of the big things that leads to Lucy's death is not just her characteristics, but the way that the men treat her. They exclude her from knowing about the vampires, they keep her in ignorance, and because she's ignorant of what's actually going on, she's actually made incapable of saving herself. And they also do this to Mina, and ultimately they're able to learn their lesson in time to save Mina. It seems to me that Stoker is saying something important here, about men and women coming together and working together, and that when they do this they're able to defeat the darkness. Part 1. Lucy Westenra. Lucy Westenra is a very interesting character. In the last episode we looked at her a little bit, but mainly in vampire form, and in this video I want to just focus on Lucy, the human being. Now Lucy is presented by Van Helsing and Dr Seward as an archetypal gothic heroine, and much is made of her purity and innocence and weakness throughout the story, not just when she's ill, but just generally to do with her character. Lucy is so sweet and sensitive that she feels influence more acutely than other people do. I greatly fear that she is of too super sensitive a nature to go through the world without trouble. To make things worse, it's not only that other characters project this kind of victim status onto Lucy, saying that she's not going to have an easy time in this world because of her vulnerabilities, but Lucy seems to internalise this and put it on herself as well. She identifies herself with two of Shakespeare's greatest victims, Desdemona and Ophelia, both of whom die in their respective plays. I sympathise with poor Desdemona when she had such a dangerous stream poured into her ear. Well, here I am tonight, hoping for sleep, and lying like Ophelia, with virgin cants and maiden strumments. Lucy's identification with victimhood and these two Shakespearean heroines already foreshadows her grim fate in the novel. Both Desdemona and Ophelia lose their lives due to the actions of corrupt men, and this will also happen to Lucy, not just because of Dracula, but also because of the men that love her. And of course, this tells us a lot about how Lucy views herself. She thinks that she is weak and passive. She feels like she is a victim because she identifies with them, and that she needs to be treated in that way. And all of this will build and lead to her death. In the previous episode, we talked about how when the male characters see Lucy as a vampire, they're incapable of recognising this vampire woman as anything like the Lucy that they knew. And this is partly because they so believe that she is this pure, virginal, weak thing that they couldn't possibly imagine that she could become this monster. The characteristics of Lucy the Vampire seem completely contradictory to the characteristics of Lucy the human being. Seward says of Lucy when she's in this vampiric form, There was no love in my own heart, nothing but loathing for the foul thing that had taken Lucy's shape without her soul. The whole carnal and unspiritual appearance seemed like a devilish mockery of Lucy's sweet purity. Now we also discussed in that video how, despite Lucy seeming to be pure and sweet and lovely on the surface, she does have these sexual desires while she is human. She talks to Mina about wanting to marry all three of her suitors at once. It's just that she represses them when she's a human being, and she's certainly not going to say those things to the men in her life. So it's only when she's in this trance-like, vampiric state that her unconsciousness is liberated and the sexual Lucy is able to come out. Now she's a slave to those desires and she can't control herself, and the men are horrified not by the monster, but by the realisation of Lucy's nature, or at least a part of it, that they never knew before. Part 2. Lucy Westenra. 
death by exclusion and dependency. There are two things, aside from the obvious thing, which is Dracula, that contribute to Lucy's death in the book. The first is to do with Lucy's character, and the second is to do with the way that the men treat Lucy while they're trying to save her life. As we've said, Lucy is not a headstrong character. She identifies herself with these victims, she's incredibly sensitive, and more importantly than that, she's very dependent on other people. She sees herself as even beneath other people sometimes. There are several parts in the novel in which she suggests that the female sex is below the male sex, something that I don't think Mina would buy into so easily. This manifests most strongly with respect to Arthur, who is the suitor that she chooses to marry and also does marry. I do not care for myself, but all for him. Lucy also rarely takes her own initiative in the story. She often copies others, especially Mina. For example, her decision to start a diary isn't taken because she thinks it might be worthwhile to keep a diary for her own benefit, but it's actually done in imitation of Mina. Lucy's one moment though where she does take initiative occurs sadly too late. On the night when Dracula comes to claim her, she's able to leave a memorandum for the men to tell them what happened. But unfortunately, it's too late and Lucy dies soon after this. Lucy's dependency is made worse by the men around her. Although they do their best to help her, literally pumping the blood of all of their bodies into hers to try and save her, they also don't see her as someone who's worth bringing in to the knowledge of Dracula. And it's not only just in this more fundamental way, but just on the surface, we see Van Helsing often talking to Lucy in an almost baby-style language that is very condescending. You know, he treats her like she really is a little child. And again, this does come from a place of love and affection. It's not that Van Helsing is horrible and hates Lucy or anything, but in not seeing her as a full person, in not seeing her as capable of dealing with this dark information, he ultimately contributes to her demise. A great example of Van Helsing doing this is in the scene at which he decides to put garlic in Lucy's bedroom to keep Dracula away. He not only patronises her in this scene, but he also tells her that she must be obedient and unquestioning. 11th of September. This afternoon I went over to Hillingham, found Van Helsing in excellent spirits, and Lucy much better. Shortly after I arrived, a big parcel from abroad came for the professor. He opened it with much impressment, assumed, of course, and showed a great bundle of white flowers. These are for you, Miss Lucy, he said. For me? Oh, Dr. Van Helsing. Yes, my dear, but not for you to play with. These are medicines. Here Lucy made a wry face. Nay, but they are not to take in a decoction or a nauseous form, so you need not snub that so charming nose, or I shall point out to my friend Arthur what woes he may have to endure in seeing so much beauty that he loves so much distort. Aha, my pretty miss, that bring the nose, so nice nose, all straight again. This is medicinal, but you do not know how. I put him in your window. I make a pretty wreath and hang him round your neck so that you sleep well. Oh yes, they, like the lotus flower, make your trouble forgotten. It smells so like the waters of Leith and of that fountain of youth conquistadors sought for in the Floridas and find him all too late. Whilst he was speaking, Lucy had been examining the flowers and smelling them. Now she threw them down, saying, with half laughter and half disgust, Oh, Professor, I believe you were only putting up a joke on me. Why, these flowers are only common garlic. To my surprise, Van Helsing rose up and said with all his sternness, his iron jaw set and his bushy eyebrows meeting, No trifling with me. I never jest. There is grim purpose in all I do, and I warn you that you do not thwart me. Take care for the sake of others, if not for your own. Then seeing poor Lucy scared, as she might well be, he went on more gently. Oh, little miss, my dear, do not fear me. I only do for your good. But there is much virtue to you in those so common flower. See, I place them myself in your room. I make myself the wreath that you are to wear. But hush, no telling to others that make so inquisitive questions. We must obey and silence is a part of obedience, and obedience is to bring you strong and well into loving arms that await for you. Little does Van Helsing know that those loving arms that await her are actually Dracula's. The exclusion of Lucy results in tragedy. Lucy dies, but it's not only Lucy that dies, her mother also dies as Dracula makes his final attack. Mrs. Westenra is also kept in the dark about the purpose of garlic and the vampires, owing to her weak heart. And it is because she doesn't know the purpose of the garlic that she has it removed from Lucy's room, thinking that it smells and makes the room stuffy. And obviously this then allows Dracula to enter the room and commit his murders. 
Now, maybe there was genuine good reason to keep Mrs. Weston right in the dark. They didn't want to give her a heart attack after all. But because they keep both women in the dark, because the men are incapable of trusting the women with this important knowledge, that ultimately leads to both of their deaths. Had Lucy known about the power of the garlic, she could have told her mother to keep it in the room. And obviously, had Lucy's mother known, she never would have taken it out in the first place. This seems to me to be one of the biggest and perhaps most overlooked messages to do with female characters in the whole novel. And it's reflected in the fates of Mina and Lucy. Lucy, kept in ignorance, dies. Mina, who takes a more active part in the story, who knows about Dracula, can push through and survive. This is one of the reasons why I don't agree with the interpretation that Lucy is the forward-thinking woman of the two. Aside from having those desires, which only really burst out when she's a vampire, Lucy is ultimately a very passive character. She's seen that way by the other people in her life, and she identifies herself with victims like Ophelia and Desdemona. The only reason it seems to me that Mina really gets downgraded by modern sensibilities is because Mina is a bit of a square. She's more straight-laced, and she does have a very infamous line where she says that she wishes to use all of her ambitions to be useful to Jonathan. And people treat this line as if it's the essence of her whole character. But we'll come to talk about Mina in the next part. Part 3. Mina Harker. So Mina Harker, in my view, is a much stronger character than Lucy. She introduces herself right from the off as an ambitious woman who is keen to learn new things. She's very talented, she's learning to write in shorthand at the beginning of the story, she's keeping a diary, and she does have a desire to be useful to Jonathan, and useful in a way that goes beyond the kitchen. To some people this might sound backward. Why does she have to be useful to Jonathan? Why can't she be useful for herself? But I think it's important to put Mina and women in the context of the time, rather than just comparing them to now and then saying that there's nothing valuable to be gained. While yes, Mina does want to support her husband, it's also clear that she has ambitions to be more than just a mere housewife. She's learning practical skills, and she wants to be able to help her husband in his work. In other words, she wants to do what she can, given her limitations in society, to contribute to the household in an economic as well as traditional way. And the fact that she has among her heroes, as she tells us, professional women journalists, suggests to me that probably she wouldn't really be content with being a purely a housewife or purely playing a support role forever. Also more broadly, I think you can view the fight for female emancipation and feminism in two ways. There's perhaps a more feudal view of feminism on which we pit men and women against each other and it's kind of dog eat dog and they fight each other and it's one against the other and ultimately there'll, there'll be an ultimate victor with either a new patriarchy or a matriarchy coming out on top. Or there is a more collaborative form of emancipation in which women and men fight for their respective rights and when they achieve them both they try and work together to improve each other's lot rather than working against each other. And it seems to me that this is the kind of feminism that Mina and Stoker seem to endorse. As I've already suggested by looking at Lucy's death and more generally I think the ultimate message of this story is that men and women do better when they work together rather than apart, and when they work together on equal terms in equal knowledge of what's going on. But as we looked at Lucy's character, let's look a little bit at Mina's. Mina is an interesting one because in some ways she's described as androgynous in the story. She's described by the male characters as having a man's brain but a woman's heart, and she certainly comes across that way in her narr narrative style as well. If we compare it to Lucy's narrative style, Lucy is incredibly feminine in a traditional sense. She comes across as a little bit of a gossip, she loves to chat and talk about her emotions, even sometimes sexual, although again she skates around it a bit. Whereas Mina is a little bit more restrained in her narrative, and her mind is often on practical concerns, and she does have a sort of masculine or professional style of writing that's very different from Lucy's. Probably the best passage for understanding Mina and how she views herself within the context of womanhood is when she talks about the concept of the new woman, which refers to a proto-feminist ideal that began in the 19th century. Mina seems to have a positive but slightly detached view of the phenomenon. It seems that she sympathises with the movement, but she's not necessarily playing an active part in it, at least in the story. Some of the new women writers will someday start an idea that men and women should be allowed to see each other asleep before proposing or accepting. But I suppose the new woman won't condescend in the future to accept. She'll do the proposing herself, and a fine job she'll make of it too. There's some consolation in that. Now there's some irony and sarcasm in what Mina is saying here, but the fact that she also adds with a little thought there that there's some consolation in this idea suggests that she does sympathise to some extent with this idea of women taking the initiative and maybe doing some proposing themselves. But she also does seem to be a little bit scandalised by some of these ideas, especially the idea of men and women seeing each other asleep before proposing. 
Now Mina is clearly very different from Lucy. It comes out not just in her ambitions, the way she sees herself as a woman, the way she sees her role in marriage, and also just her writing style when compared to Lucy's. And yet, despite these differences, the male characters in the story want to treat Mina as if she is like Lucy. Although they might say that she has a man's brain, that woman's heart is just holding her back. And so, while at first they allow her to sit in on some of their meetings, there comes a point in the story at which the men decide that it is time for them to take over and for Mina to take a back seat. The harshest part of this is that Jonathan, her husband, also agrees on this, despite having promised between each other that they will never keep secrets between each other. And this seems to have a fundamental impact on Mina and their relationship, perhaps. And of course, just like the decision to keep Lucy and her mother in the dark led to tragedy, the same thing happens with Mina. While the men are away hunting Dracula, Mina is visited by Dracula and falls ill. It's obvious to the reader what is happening because we've seen this all before, but the men are so consumed by the hunt, and because they do sort of think that Mina can just deal with it because she's not as obvious in her victimhood as Lucy, they don't really notice that she's getting sick, or at least in a way that troubles them. It's only by luck that they find out that Mina has become a victim of Dracula, and from that point on, Mina is invited back into the fold for the hunt. So once again, we have men trying to be, you know, admirable. Again, they're not doing it because they're horrible, but they have this urge to protect the female characters, and they do this by keeping them in the dark. But in doing this, they actually end up putting the women in danger. With Lucy and Mrs. Westenra, this leads to their deaths, and Mina has a lucky escape and doesn't lose her life. Mina begins her story wishing to be useful to her husband. She wants to be seen by him as an equal partner in the marriage, with valuable contributions to make. Marriage, after all, is meant to be a partnership, and so it probably works best when it's treated as such. But Jonathan, although he recognises Mina's male brain, is persuaded by Van Helsing and the others to recognise that his wife does have that female heart, and therefore she has to be protected, and this leads to disaster. And so what Jonathan and the other men have to learn by the end of the story is that if they want to fight evil, to confront the dark desires that they have in themselves and master them, then they're going to have to work together with women as equals. So thinking about Dracula as a feminist novel, I think it can be read in such a way. But I also think that it goes beyond feminism, at least certain strands of feminism in certain ways too, and can be seen much more broadly than that. And that, to me, always makes a good novel. I don't, you know, you don't want a novel to be overly constrained by theories that literature people impose on them. You want them to go broader, you want them to expand your mind in some way. And I think Dracula does that. Abstracting all the way from gender, ultimately the biggest evil in Dracula is not the Count, but ignorance. Now in the novel, this plays out in terms of gender, in the sense that it is the female characters who are kept ignorant by the men, and therefore they're the ones who suffer most when it comes to Dracula. But nevertheless, the deeper theme here is that ultimately truth it will set you free. Truth will allow you to fight evil. And that to me seems to be the more fundamental message underneath the story. But we'll talk about that in a future episode. All right, that's it for this video. Let me know down in the comments what you think of my thoughts today. And please give me your thoughts on these topics as well. Always love talking with you in the comments. Take care, everyone. Ta-ra.